Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios in New Delhi. I'm Sidhan Tani and you're watching a much delayed episode of Daily Debrief. Today we have updates from Honduras. Uh, we're talking about Afghanistan and we have our weekly COVID update as well. Uh, first up, we've reported earlier on the election of Jomara Castro as the leader of Honduras and the progressive anti-corruption, anti-status quo regime that she and her allies are seeking to establish in a nation right in the thick of the United States area of influence. Troubles have cropped up for Castro and her nation as varied agendas start to make a mark on the national political scheme. We spoke earlier to Zoe, who covers the region for People's Dispatch, for all the details on what's happening in Honduras. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. So it's just been a few months since Xiomara Castro was elected the president. At that time, of course, it was a, it was a great moment, is a great moment for the left and progressive movements in Latin America. But people had also warned that there would definitely be some kind of pushback as well. And it looks like we are seeing the first instances of that. So maybe could you first take us through what's really happening right now in Honduras? Yeah, thanks so much, Prashant. I mean, yeah, this was something that people were wary of. Of course, a progressive leader winning after 12 years of rule by the National Party, which is a far right party that came to power through a coup, sustained power through you know numerous instances of electoral fraud. And essentially what has happened and unfolded over the past week is that a faction of the ruling Libre Party, um, which was able to maintain sort of a, you know, an important section of the Congress, um, of the elected representatives in the Congress, um, they essentially uh, broke with consensus. The Libre Party had made an agreement with other parties to kind of create this grand coalition when they were going into the elections uh, last November. Um, and in this agreement, uh, a, you know, a deputy from the uh, Salvador Party of Honduras, which made an alliance with the Libre Party, would have the, um, uh, would be elected president of the Congress under this agreement. And a faction of the representatives from Libre broke with this uh, consensus, with this agreement, and said that they do not, that they are going to elect their own representative. And I think what's important to point out is that um, in this kind of breaking within Libre, these Senate, these deputies, the first people they run to are the National Party of Honduras. So it's quite telling in that sense that they are willing to betray the party um, that has promised change for Honduras and make a pact with the, you know, the far right party um, and rely on support from them. So essentially what's happened is that they said that they will not elect um, this deputy, uh, Luis Redondo from the Salvador party as president of the Congress. Um, they had they actually called a separate session, a parallel session of Congress to elect their own leadership of the Congress in response to this, in a response to these moves to break with this uh, consensus. Um, the Libre Party has called for a vigil, a 24 hour vigil outside the National Congress installations, which they have maintained and essentially in uh, blocked uh, these far right sections from entering the Congress building, forcing them to have their parallel session outside the city. So the Libre Party and the kind of parties that are sticking with this agreement have held their own session in National Congress. These parallel sections have set, held another session. Currently, we're looking at a situation where there are two technical elected bodies uh, to rule over this Congress. And, you know, of course, that's sort of a, an undermining of the institutional uh, legitimacy in Honduras at this moment. Right, absolutely. So uh, are these uh, rebel candidates, these people who stepped out of the consensus, is there a likelihood of their working more closely with the National Party? And if so, what does that mean for the Libre Party's parliamentary majority opposition in parliament? Yeah, I think this is key. Um, so the, the members of the National Party of Honduras actually also attended this parallel session. And so they had, you know, more numbers because they were you know, rallying support from these far right sections, some members of the Liberal Party, other members of the Liberal Party attended the more official legitimate session in um, the actual con uh, Congress uh, installations. Um, but it is likely that this signifies a shift towards the right of these uh, elected members. They have been since ejected from the Libre Party. This, of course, threatens their majority position in the Congress. A lot of the key legislation and a lot of the key transformations that Xiomara Castro wants to achieve have to be achieved first in the Congress um, to repeal the ZEDES legislation, which creates autonomous development zones where foreign corporations can impose, you know, 
labor legislation foreign to that of Honduras, that has to go through the Congress um, to repeal a lot of the regressive legislation that has gone through during these 12 years of coup, that has to go through Congress. And so this is a serious, uh, poses a serious challenge, but uh, the Honduran people have rallied behind Xiomara Castro. You know, this is who they elected. They elected this project of change and transformation. And, you know, we have uh, in two days, uh, she will be sworn in as president uh, in under the constitution. She would be normally sworn in by the president of the Congress. And she has elected to be sworn in by a judge to kind of, you know, bypass these great kind of institutional uh, uh, debate that's happening right now. Right. Thank you so much, Zoe. We'll be keeping, we'll keep on following this issue as well. The first Taliban delegation to visit Europe since returning to power in Afghanistan began talks on Sunday in Oslo with Afghan civil society members focused on human rights ahead of highly anticipated meetings with Western officials. Headed by Foreign Minister Amir Khan Muttaki, the delegation is to de uh, dedicate the first day of their three-day visit to talks with women activists and journalists, among other people. The discussion, which are being facilitated by Norway and are to focus on human rights and the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, are taking place behind closed doors at a hotel on the outskirts of Oslo. Prashant, the Taliban have arrived in Norway and have stated quite clearly that this is as much about their image and image building uh, as anything else. What are some of the concrete things, though, that are being discussed in these talks? Right, Sidan, before we talk about what is happening in Oslo right now, we need to sort of realize the extent of the crisis that uh, is uh, taking place in Afghanistan right now. So we know that the Taliban took over in August 2021. And ever since the country's economy has completely crashed, a large part of it due to the fact that the economy that was built on uh, after the US occupation in 2001 was pretty much completely sustained by foreign aid and intervention. So up to 80% of the economy was apparently done with foreign assistance. Now, at a time when, uh, you know, this, the speed of the Taliban take over the fact that the US was not prepared for it, uh, basically meant that the US withdrew, the Western powers withdrew, and their immediate solution, of course, like in every case, was to impose sanctions, was to freeze funds. So we know that, we, we were talked about this often and on the show, we know that close to $10 billion of the Afghanistan National Bank's reserves have been frozen by the United States. Various other forms of assistance also blocked. It's only very recently in December that the United Nations first passed resolution saying that humanitarian aid could resume. The United States withdrew, uh, you know, or, or gave some authorizations permitting some humanitarian organizations to work with the UN, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of aid. But all this actually does not really address the root of the crisis, which is that Afghanistan really does not have, uh, you know, uh, any resources per se right now. They're struggling. There is no money to pay the civil servants, large part of the population facing various degrees of hunger, some facing what is called very acute hunger, some facing very severe hunger, you know, a huge percentage of the population going below the poverty line. So all this in mind, uh, it's a very difficult situation in Afghanistan. We need to be very cognizant of that. And this is the context in which the Taliban and the West is meeting. Now, as far as, like you said, both sides are very different agendas. Let's be clear about it. The Taliban uh, wants to sort of acquire legitimacy and that's their single biggest goal because so far they have not been recognized by a single government in the world at least in 1996 when the taliban was last in power the uae south Arabia, and pakistan had recognized it right now it's not recognized by anybody so and they do they do know that they're not going to get recognized but we nonetheless want to get the position of being the de facto government with which everyone is forced to work with and the talks in Oslo for the taliban are a key moment as far as is concerned because they're not only meeting with human rights organizations, they're meeting with, I mean, they have met with. Today was the last day of the talks, Sunday, Monday, today. So uh, yesterday and today were talks with the Western diplomats and Sunday was the human rights organizations, like you mentioned. So uh, so for them, it's the, that's really the key question that is uh, uh, gaining some kind of legitimacy, gaining you know uh, a, a foothold, and this later becomes a precedent also. We need to note, of course, that this is already happening in the region. We talked about it before. All the regional powers have been engaging at various levels with the Taliban, some openly, some a bit more uh, in camera, so to speak. But these are uh, Taliban has already been accepted as a de facto government by uh, the regional powers. The West, for the longest time, has been hesitating about it. So I would think that this is a key moment in the West accepting finally that uh, the Taliban is the de facto government. Uh, it's a, I mean, you rightly pointed out all the issues, right? The humanitarian crisis, close to 40 million 
uh, people living in poverty there, which is huge. And uh, some reports saying close to a million children uh, facing starvation in the middle of winter also, uh, which makes things that much harder. Uh, and also this legitimacy debate, right, which is uh, a vital one uh, because they are the de facto power in place. So uh, in that context, since also we have to remember, like, like you have pointed out, that this in a way is a problem that's been created by the US and its allies by starting the war in Afghanistan in the first place. So, so in all of that context, Prashant, uh, what are the options really for the US, particularly in terms of dealing with this humanitarian crisis? It really is a question as to whether they are in some senses trying to placate their internal audio, you know, internal domestic constituencies by centering this discussion on human rights first as a pretext before they sort of try to come back into Afghanistan, so to speak. So that's really mm -hmm. a question. Now, let's be very clear that Taliban has broken all the promises it made uh, in, uh, you know, in the months before they took over in 2021 about an inclusive government, about, about you know, respecting the rights of various minorities of women, etc. Uh, as we can see, there have been protests in Afghanistan by women demanding their rights. There have been very severe restrictions continue to be in place. So let's be very clear about it. The Taliban, you know, has pretty much, uh, you know, uh, behaved as everyone predicted would. But now, as far as the West is concerned, they need some kind of a pretext to sort of go back. So one wonders if, you know, this is also in some senses the West saying that, okay, uh, give us some kind of commitments that you're going to address some of these issues. And then we will actually look at a more sustained form of engagement. So we do see that, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, the European Union is back in Afghanistan. We will, I think in the coming uh, months and weeks, we will see more of uh, Western, you know, institutions actually setting up shop in Afghanistan, so to speak. And uh, as we discussed again before on the show, the West is very much concerned that uh, you know, they do not wish to completely lose Afghanistan or their toehold on Afghanistan completely and give it up to China and uh, Russia, especially, you know, since Pakistan is now also close to China. So with all these factors in mind, I think that uh, the West is also looking for a way to sort of get back. Uh, one, of course, keeping in mind the crisis. Key two, keeping in mind the uh, geopolitical and strategic imperatives of the region and the United States need to contain China. So I think there is only so much uh, that uh, so much longer that they can keep adopting a completely antagonistic position as well. All right. Thanks for that update, Prashant. Right, and finally on the show today, joining us is NewsClick Editor-in-Chief editor Prabhi Purkayasta, uh, who's been giving us regular updates on the global COVID situation. Prabhi, thanks for joining us once again on Daily Debrief. Um, what are the latest numbers telling us? What can we learn from them? Well, I think what we got from the Gauteng province uh, region in South Africa is what we're seeing almost everywhere else, that you have a sharp, almost a vertical rise particularly in certain cities, which seem to act as a nodes for countries. And then from there, you have a sharp drop in the place which it started, where it started from. So the drop is not as sharp as the vertical takeoff when it goes up. So yes, the numbers do fall, fall quite rapidly, but not as steeply as the numbers going up. So that's one thing to be kept in mind. The second is from that, it spreads to other cities, because after all, we are interlinked today. And once the other cities take off, then the regions get affected as well. And after some time, we find the country numbers going up. This is exactly what we saw in UK, what we see in the US now, also in France, also in India, where the numbers have gone up, starting with some of the cities. Three cities went up very quickly. After that, we find other cities are rising as these cities which acted as the initial loads seem to be falling. One thing that we have to take into account when you talk about the Omicron being not as dangerous as Delta, which is true, it doesn't seem to cause as serious illness as Delta. But if you take the 2020 original strains and the strains which are not Delta, then it doesn't seem to show that Omicron is less dangerous in the people it infects, except for the fact if you are vaccinated or you have a prior illness, so you have some body immunity, then maybe you don't develop serious cases, but the unvaccinated do seem to show serious cases in large numbers. And they are the ones who are now in the ICUs in a lot of the hospitals, particularly in the United States, where there are pools of unvaccinated people for whatever reasons that might be. And they seem to be more in the intensive care unit. So these are some of the pictures that you see. 
Yes, Omicron is much more infectious in terms of transmission. It seems to transmit much more easily. It transmits much faster. Therefore, you see really large numbers and also vaccine escape. But even if you have immunity to serious disease, it doesn't prevent you from getting infected. It also shows a lot of asymptomatic cases, which is why the transmission is also so high. Right. Uh, it's, it is, of course, year three now, and there's a, there's a sort of simultaneous uh, debate going on about endemic and pandemic. Uh, what, what, why, is, why, are these, uh, why is the semantics of this important, Praveer? Praveer. See, I think if the, the quote-unquote number of infections are large enough that it is a risk to your public health system, then you will call it pandemic. If it's a worldwide, uh, you'll call it an epidemic. If it's in one country, you'll call it a pandemic if it's worldwide. So effectively, it is not so much just the virus that we are talking about, the disease itself, but the impact on the public health system, which is what constitutes epidemic or a pandemic. And I think by that reckoning, we still are in a pandemic stage because if you see the United States today, then the number of hospitals or serious patients or deaths, all of these are rising. And if you take India, for example, yes, the hospitals don't seem to be stressed as yet, but we have to see what happens as the uh, epidemic progresses in India. So if you take that account, that into account, it's the public health system plus the number of people who fall ill in the epidemic that constitutes whether we take it or how seriously we take it. If we have to take it seriously, it's still an epidemic. If it's worldwide, it's a pandemic. We say it's endemic when the public health system can cope with the number of infections we get. For instance, you have influenza and influenza at its peak years can infect a million, two million people. The number of people it kills per year is still high, but we don't call it a, a pandemic or an endemic because the public health system is geared to take, a, take care of it. And it doesn't stress the public health system beyond a point. So that is, I think, the issue. It's not a question of numbers, by the way, because, you know, uh, as we said, the flu takes 600 to 800,000, you know, uh, infections per year. Uh, if we don't call it an epidemic each year. Uh, but you have, on the other hand, polio, which only has a few cases per year. And we still call both endemic. So I think mm -hmm. that endemic is a very large uh, uh, spread, is a very large uh, set of uh, numbers that we are talking about. And what we are talking about, that something which is not an epidemic is therefore endemic. I think that's more the way we should see it. And if with the hospitals can take care of the number of infections, if the number of people falling seriously ill are not high, then we'll have to say that we are moving to a, from an epidemic to a pandemic, uh, to an endemic state. And endemic I think state. That's, the, that's how the epi epidemiologists use the term. It is not so much bodies resistance and so on, but a combination of resistance, combination of the hospital system and the number of infections, which decide when we call it an endemic. And yes, mm -hmm. we are moving towards an endemic state because we are by vaccination, by infections, we are producing uh, resistance in the body, immunity in the body, and we are not falling that seriously ill. Therefore, the hospitals are able to take care of it. But all bets are off if new variants emerge, which can be more transmissible, vaccine mm. escape, as well as causing serious illnesses. If that happens, then all bets are off. So we shouldn't, at the moment, feel that we are on the way, we should be comfortable, give it six months, everything will be hunky-dory. That's not the scenario. And important, I guess, to remember also that whatever the semantics might be or whatever the terminology used might be, it in no way uh, denotes or uh, gives the impression that this is any less dangerous in terms of the kind of, the kind of impact it has. Thanks very much, Prabir. We'll hopefully again next week. That's all we have on the show for today from me and the entire People's Dispatch team. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, for more on these stories, you can visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And please give us a follow on all the regular social media platforms for updates on all the work we do. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow. Goodbye.